Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hisham Yusuf. I'm a second year here at Harris. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I'll hand over the mic here to, uh, to our guest speaker momentarily, but first, I want to set you up for success. Um, the first time I met Mr. Uh, John McCourt was last summer during our Northern Ireland trip here with Pearson, um, where we were studying the troubles. And it was early morning, and Sheila, forgive me, I did not read the read ahead. I did not read the bio. And so when I met Mr. McCourt, I was like, you know, I was a little tired. It was the morning. I was like, wow, what a jolly professor type. You know, he's very, very kind. Sure. Uh, Peacenik, I think. Right. OK, cool. Um, I mean, it's sort of true. Mr. McCourt has been in a community peace. He's been a community peace activist for over 40 years. But I must admit, there was a little bit of discounting uh, of the gentleman at first. But then as the day went on, this jolly Professor Peacenick began to tell us about what he saw on Bloody Sunday in uh, 1969, where the British Army shot dead 14 peaceful protesters. More than just be, be there, he witnessed firsthand the murder of his friends coming face to face with the soldiers that pulled the trigger. And were it not for fate, he could have been one of those 14. He was actively engaged in almost every aspect of the conflict. And as the Derry Museum on the event would attest, pictures of young John do exist with rifle in hand. Peacenick. This man has seen both ends of the rifle. I should have known better. That's not the last time I discounted an elder with a deep and painful history. You see, I grew up in the Middle East in the 1990s. And being an Arab boy, I imbibed a sort of romanticism around armed struggle, the dashing Yasser Arafat and his kafia, military fatigues. Evil existed, but it was somewhere else, not with us. It was somewhere else, and it had a name. It was Britain, it was America, it was Israel. So you can only imagine my confusion when my parents said we're moving to the United States. Confusing. But confusing still was when I caught a glimpse of the Star of David in the house of our neighbor. A kindly old woman, Mrs. Hamburger, I'd fetch her groceries and she'd feed me cookies. Jews don't hand out cookies to Arabs. It was very, very confusing to me at the time. What's more, she bore scars uh, of evil inflicted on her. This elderly Jewish immigrant had a tattoo on her arm. She was an immigrant from Germany and a Holocaust survivor. So confusing. Conflict resolution, you understand, uh, requires our inhabiting and human humanizing the other, understanding their fears and their grievances. It was also very confusing, but confusion is another word to grapple with complexity. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, if only it were so simple, if only there were evil people and it were necessary only to separate them and destroy them, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through every heart. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Picking up a gun is brave, but putting it down requires an altogether different kind of rarer, deeper courage. John McCourt exemplifies that sort of court courage for us today. I can think of no deeper honor than to introduce someone who has lived the journey from moral outrage to moral, moral courage to peacemaker. Don't discount this man. Ladies and gentlemen, John McCourt. I was wondering why those small pockets were there. <laughs> now I know. Now, first of all, thanks very much for that, for the introduction. Um, and over there, as always happens, embarrassed as you're speaking. Um, because for me, I do what I do for one reason. Because I've done what I've done. And I've lived the life that I've lived. And uh, 
I think to tell you the story, and first of all, what, if, if there's anybody else here that's been on the Ireland trip, welcome. Um, hopefully I get to meet you later. I hear there's a place called the Green Mill that does jazz. I'm up for that. Somebody will find it for me. Um, and uh, so what I, what I need to do is paint a picture for people, first of all, of where this came from, of where the last, certainly the last 40 years have come from, 40 plus years have come from. And uh, it's a part of a story I know most of the students, I don't talk about it. But when I get to the end, hopefully this will start to make sense. I'm also very conscious of your time. And if somebody just gives me a time check now, what have I got? Uh, about 30 minutes and then 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay, great. So we're going to go right in. Um, I am from Derry in, Northern, in the north of Ireland. And again, anybody who gets confused by our use of language, it's about identity. And the whole thing's about identity. For me, it's the north of Ireland. For other people, it's going to be Northern Ireland. If you're looking on a map, it's going to be Northern Ireland. If you're looking on a map, you're looking for London Derry or Derry. I'm a Derry man. London Derry is the same place, but it's not what I call it. It's, uh, I, I always say this, it's the only city in the world that has six silent letters at the start of its name. <laughs> um, I'm a Derry man. And strange enough, I came to the city from uh, just outside of the city. Um, my father was in the Royal Air Force. Um, during the Second World War, he was in an anti-submarine patrol in the North Atlantic. He got shot down. He survived. He was rescued. He was taken to Reykjavik in Iceland, and after the war, he was repatriated. And then for some stupid reason that he never told me, after being shot down out of a perfectly good airplane, he decides to join the Air Force again. <laughs> At that point, he's married to my mother. And in 1955, on his way into the base in the early hours of the morning, he was hit by a car, um, seriously injured, and they scraped him up off the road. They put him on a stretcher, took him onto the base, put him on a plane, and flew him to a military hospital in England. I didn't see my father for over 20 years after that. They went to tell my mother what happened. My mother was pregnant with my younger sister. I have a brother that's a year older than me, a brother that's a year younger than me. And my mother was pregnant with my younger sister. When they told her what happened, she went into labor. She was taken off to the hospital. And then for many, many years, the only way I could phrase this was that somebody made a decision that temporarily we would go into care. The decision was actually made, and I found this out in 2012. The, the decision was actually made by a parish priest who my mother didn't even know that temporarily we would go into care. And myself and my two brothers on an October night with the wind howling and I'm three, almost four years of age. All I remember from that night was the wind and the crunch of the gravel in the driveway outside this children's home. Big Georgian house. Um, I was taken on the front door. My younger brother was taken down the side steps and my older brother was taken in another door. Our names were taken away. I was number 10. My younger brother was number 54 and my older brother was number 58 or number 48. And for 10 years, that's what we were. Why we got those numbers? Those were the numbers of the empty coat hooks of people who had already gone out of the children's home. You see the big Georgian house and the lovely gardens? We weren't in the big Georgian house. This is the back of the Georgian house. You can actually see the tin shed there. This was a children's home in the north of Ireland in 1955. It was on a 290 acre farm. There were three separate units. At any one time, there were over 180 children in that home, aged between three and 16 years of age, because when you were 16, if you weren't fostered out, you were more or less sold off to a farmer. And that was you gone, you're out of the system, and there's no aftercare, there's no social worker looking after you, there's nobody checking where you're gone or how you're being treated or any of the rest of it. But then again, that wouldn't have been strange, because while we were in there, there was no social worker, there was nobody checking to see how you were. Um, this is one of the group... 
and way over there. Just I don't know if it is. A, yeah, it is working. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's me over at the end. I've got another photograph of that. And I'm going to show you in a while. And the reason why I look so bedraggled in that is I'm 10 years of age. I just got out of the hospital. I spent five weeks in the hospital where a nun had taken a wooden towel roller and cracked it off the top of my skull. I had a fractured skull that had a subdural hematoma. And for five weeks, I had a doctor stick a needle in the top of my head to draw the blood off to take the pressure off my brain. I don't know what done me any damage or not, but I'll tell you what, it scared me from, from needles about syringes for life. Um, here's a photograph taken outside the city's Guild Hall. People who have been in Derry will know it. It's the big one with the, with the clock on the top of it. It looks like a cathedral or a church. And it's the city's uh, administrative centre. It's where the corporation would meet. And uh, I'm in that photograph. Um, where am I? Yeah, that's me. Strange enough, in that photograph, my two brothers were in that photograph. I didn't even know who they were. And that's eight years after I went under the children's home. I didn't know who they were. Um, let's go photo. You don't want to see that. <laughs> this is the photo. And... Again, I mean, this is, it's about that part of a journey, you know. That first photograph's taken in, I think, about, yeah, it would have been 1962. That photograph's taken in 1972. In case you're wondering, that's me. And that photograph's taken in 2012. Everything that I learned through that journey informed my thinking on how you could make a change. There is a way of doing things. Stand on the street with a gun in your hand. Yeah, you're going to impact some people's lives. And people, as a result of, that, of the conflict, 38 years of conflict, lost their lives. In fact, 3,600 people lost their lives as a result of the conflict in the North. 465 of them lost their lives in my city. And among them were friends of mine, neighbors of mine. There were soldiers, there were policemen, there were people who just happened to be there that day who died as a result of the conflict. And that's for me as part of the, the argument of force. I did okay in school, strange enough. Um, one of those guys, stuff went into your head, run down your arm and went straight onto the page. I actually didn't have to cram for anything. And when I was 16, almost 17, I got a scholarship. I'd really been interested in engineering. When I came out of the children's home at 13 years of age, um, and I went to live in this neighborhood, the community actually took us in. I mean, I remember people coming to my mother and saying, if there's anything you need. It wasn't, we weren't talking about um, an act of charity. These were people who just cared. Something that was so alien to me. Because in that children's home, and I'm, I will be talking about this later, all of the abuses that you can imagine could happen to a child happened in front of my eyes, and quite a few of them happened to me. When I came out of there at 13 years of age, I was ready for a fight. I walked down the street with each, down the avenue with these two children, my two brothers, who I just got to know. And I could have went down the night before and packed any two boys in that home and said, you're my brother and you're my brother, you're coming with me. And it wouldn't have made any difference because I had absolutely no ties to them. But I remember saying to my older brother, from then on, when the gardener let us out the gate and shut the gate behind us, yeah, it was a cloistered environment. I remember saying to my brother, um, nobody gets to put their boot on the back of my neck again. And that was in 1965. And I'm 70 years of age now. And I've made sure that it hasn't happened by whatever means to ensure it didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen. Um, oh, yeah. 
And uh, so I'm, I get this scholarship and school starts in September. At the end of September, a guy walks into the student's common room, puts a notice on the board. This is the notice. A civil rights march will be held in Derry. And I looked at him and said, what do you want about civil rights? That's Martin Luther King territory. That's Mississippi and Alabama. That's black people getting beaten up by the police. I said, that's nothing to do with us. And he said, all right, has. I said, this is about houses. This is about jobs. This is about votes. One man, one vote. This was an abandoned U.S. Army camp in Derry. But at the end of the war, the servicemen just left it, got in trucks, went away, and left it. This was still where people were living after they'd squatted into the empty Nissan huts that the American servicemen had left behind. This is where they were still living in 1967 and 1968. Three families to a hut, but three families to a hut was better than one whole family to a room in a tenement block. And that's where they went. And initially, there were something like 300 of these huts. By the time the camp closed, there were still 90 of those huts being used. Employment. Civil rights was about employment. It was about an end to discrimination and employment. And if anybody's looking at this, if you look at the bottom, it's not a signature. It's actually an official excuse not to give somebody a job, not to employ them. And the interest, uh, you're asked to state fully why you did not engage the applicant, religion, a legitimate reason for not giving somebody a job. And the march started over on the other side of the river. I live on what we call the city side or the West Bank, something you'd be familiar with. Um, and the march was to start on the other side of the river. It's come through the, come across the bridge, go through the city, and it was supposed to end at the war memorial. But the government decided that they didn't want a bunch of anybody who doesn't understand the language in this. Um, the government decided that they didn't want a bunch of Fenians or a bunch of Catholics protesting about rights at their war memorial, at their sacred space. Even though a project done in the year 2000 went through every one of the names and 50% of the names on the war memorial are actually from the Catholic community. But it was still claimed as being unionist territory, and it would be, it would be almost a sacrilege to allow Catholics to protest at it. So the march went to the Guild Hall. Uh, it, the alternative venue was going to be the Guild Hall, but it didn't get that far. I'd said to one of the young guys in my class who was a Protestant, and that's a strange thing. I was 17 years of age when I went in and sat down in a room for the first time in my life with real live Protestants, and they weren't trying to convert me, and they weren't trying to steal me soul or any of that stuff. They're just ordinary guys who like football and music and actually the same stuff that I like. And uh, that's one of the problems we brought up in a, in, a, in a real isolated community where they can tell you anything that they want to tell you just to convince you that everybody else out there is evil, you know. And uh, this young Protestant guy, I said to him, look, we'll go and see what the march is about. I'm not going on it, but I want to see so we went over, we st actually stood on the city side of the bridge, the march was on the other side of the river. And I said to him, uh, well, we better get over it. I don't want to miss the start of this march. And he looked at me for a minute and he went, oh, John, no, I think I'll leave it. And he turned and he walked up the hill and I didn't see him for over 35 years after that day. People keep walking out of my life. And just as he left, Five big grey vans with big glass windows on them came down out of the city and crossed the bridge. They were full of policemen. I've never seen so many policemen in the one place in my life. Because I'm from a community that was more afraid of the priest than of the police. If there was a problem in a neighborhood, people went to the parochial house. They didn't call the police. You might have seen a policeman when it came to census. You might have seen a policeman, yeah, a policeman maybe handing out a summons to some kid for kicking football in the uh, street or riding a bicycle with no light on it. But that was our only contact with the police. So this was to be my first contact and a lot of people from my community's first contact with the police. And you can see what happened here. This is the state's use of force. Water cannon. And very shortly after that, to prevent an attack on the area that we loved in, 
in the bog side and the Craigan, in the nationalist area of the city, we closed off the whole place. We ripped up every curbstone, every flagstone that was there, and we barricaded off an area that was a, almost a mile deep and a quarter of a mile wide, right to the very top of the hill. And that was to stop the police coming in. And eventually, in a, another protest, another riot, and we got quite good at riots. And I started carrying a placard. I started singing songs. I started on this, you know, sitting on the road, linking arms and singing, we shall overcome. Um, yeah, we shall overcome. It's amazing. Um, you know, and I remember somebody talking about Jesus saying, you know, turn the other cheek. Actually, when you're sitting on the road and, and you get hit on that side, and then you turn the other cheek and you get hit on that side, you have nothing left, you have nothing left to turn. And at that point, you have to stand up. Well, your choice is stand up or lie down. And we were certainly weren't for lying down. And uh, so what we did was we barricaded off this whole area. We declared it free dairy. And uh, the community themselves were responsible, uh, responsible for this. And just remember, there hadn't been the re-emergence of the IRA at this point. The barricades went up. And then in April 1969, a riot on William Street, a bunch of kids throwing rocks at the police, stones at the police, whatever at the police. And the police chased them up the street. They run in an open door of a house. They went through the kitchen. They went out into the backyard and over the wall. The police went into the house, into the kitchen, out into the backyard. The young guys were gone. So seven policemen come back into the house, go into the living room of the house where Sammy Devaney, his wife, his five children, and a family friend were watching television. And for something like 20 minutes, seven policemen beat into that family. Sammy Devaney would eventually die of the injuries that he received. And uh, of course we were angry. Sammy Devaney died in June. We wanted to get our own back, but of course the great and the good are talking about no retaliation. There's no point talking to a 17, 18, 19 year old with that anger about no retaliation. We want to get our own back. And Derry has traditionally three big marches every year. And the closest march to the, to, to, to the death of Sammy Devaney would have been July, but the July march was further up the county. So the next march was going to be the Apprentice Boys Parade in Derry on the, on the 11th of August, 1969. So we strengthened the barricades. We went down to the end of the road and we waited. Not for the march. We, I wasn't interested in them. Actually, I loved the sound of the bands of the Apprentice Boys. I love music. I played in the band and the children's home, one of the distractions that I had. What we were waiting for was as this march went, the police would come. And the police came. And eventually the first word gets shouted and then the first stone got thrown and then the first petrol bomb got thrown and then the police decided they'd had enough. And they decided they were going to beat us back into the bog site. So they jumped in their army car and they run up the street and as the armored car turned into Russell Street, the main street that goes all the way through the bog side, right through the Brandywell, the barricade that we'd strengthened, when they looked out the tiny slit on the front of the armored car, all they could see was a line of pavement slabs. They didn't know that that line of pavement slabs was actually four deep. So when they, they thought the armored car would hit it, this thing would burst and then they'd be in. And what happened when they hit it was the armored car stalled. It went up in the air, it came down. And... Uh, the door opened and a policeman fell out and that started a three-day riot. And this is part of that three-day riot. These are gone now. You've heard me talk about the apartment blocks that used to be on Roxville Street. Well, that's what they're like. And you can see the strategic advantage of the apartment block because crates of petrol bombs were taken up in the elevator, put out on the roof and thrown down on the police below. And that went on for three days and eventually... We beat the police out of the bog site. They used something like 4,000 canisters of tear gas over two days. This whole place was a, a cloud, a fog of CS gas, of tear gas. And a lot of our older people ended up suffering. A lot of our children ended up suffering as a direct result of that. Of course, the government decided they didn't want an inquiry into the use of, of CS gas. And then the army arrived. And when they arrived... People were down bringing them tea. They're bringing them sandwiches. They're applauding them. The army are here. We're saved. The army are here. We're saved. Yeah, great. That's why they're bringing their barbed wire. 
not that our barricades weren't enough, now they wanted their barricades as well. And when they're standing there, they're standing with their rifles and their, bain their bayonets pointed towards us, and they're here to protect us. I remember that first truck coming up the Strand Road, and it stopped. And I saw a young soldier jump out of it, and as he jumped out of it, his rifle went one way, and he went another way, and the officer started shouting at him, and he gathered up his stuff rather embarrassed. And he was about the same age as me, he'd been 17, 18 years of age, just a young guy. What he didn't know and what we didn't know was he would be the first of half a million sets of soldiers' feet that would tramp their way around the north of Ireland in the longest ever British military um, operation. Operation Banner was the last um, 38 years. And what neither of us knew was by the time the last soldier would leave, over three and a half thousand people would die. I often think if we knew then what we know now, would we? Could we? And that's why I made a decision to join the Irish Republican Army. And for the next seven years, right through to 1976, when I got really sick, um, this is what we did. And it was about, initially it was about the defense of this area from the police, from the army, and eventually, um, the government decided that they weren't going to, that nationalists had crossed the line. That's actually in the bog side. And on the 9th of August, 1971, the Northern Ireland government introduced internment. That meant that anybody, on the word of a senior police officer, who was deemed to be posing or potentially pose a threat to the security of the state to be detained for as long as that threat existed. And over 400 people from the Catholic community were detained by the army and by the police and taken off to internment camps. That's a camp used to be a, an Air Force base during the Second World War. Its old name was Long Cash. Its Air Force, its airfield name was Long Cash. It got changed and they called it the maze, but anybody who's been there will still call it Long Cash. And so they used the uh, Long Cash. And they also used a prison ship. See, this stuff's not new. This stuff's all happened before. The Patriot Act is not new. It's all happened before. In-depth interrogation, which happened to these people, the hooded men, is not new. Black sites are not new. They all happened before. And protests against internment started around the north, and the Civil Rights Association decided we're not going to hold small protests everywhere. Let's hold one big protest on the 30th of January 1972 in Derry. 15 or 20,000 people set off from the top of the hill to march to the Guildhall Square in Derry to protest against internment, singing songs and pushing prams and having fun with their friends and guys coming, great place to meet girls, and I'm being honest. And uh, because there was nothing else to do, you couldn't go to, you couldn't really go to dances and stuff like that. I mean, this is where you met people, was at marches and demonstrations. And the march started off, and again, people are singing the songs, we shall overcome and all the rest. Nobody expected what was going to, what was potentially about to happen. And the march gets down as far as William Street and the government decide the march doesn't get into the Guildhall Square. And the Civil Rights Association deciding that they didn't want young people getting into a confrontation with the army because there so, were so many people on this march. There were children on this march. There were women pushing prams on this march. There were old people on this march. The Civil Rights Association didn't want to put them at risk. So what they did was they sent down a line of stewards before uh, the march got that far down, and they blocked off the top of William Street so we couldn't get down to where the army were. And they directed the march over towards Free Dairy Corner, that wall that I showed you earlier on. And a lot of people complied. But you're 19 years of age. I didn't come to march to the box. I, I, neither did my friends. We came to march to the Guild Hall. And that's what we were doing. So we got through the line of stewards, pushed through them, went down. And as we say in Derry, um, engaged with the army. And uh, a bit of shouting and roaring started first, and then soldiers started firing batten rounds, rubber bullets. And uh, they brought up a water cannon. 
And this was a regular occurrence in Derry. In fact, we called it a recreational riot, and there was nothing else to do on a Saturday afternoon. You could have those stones to the army and get chased up and down the street. You know, and then you go home and you get your tea. And that's that, you know. Um, and that's what we actually thought this was going to be, the same as the riot that had taken place the day before or the week before or the week before. And then what happened when they brought the armored car up was as the army uh, decided they weren't having it. They broke the brought up their spearhead regiment. At three minutes past four, the spearhead regiment got in their armored cars. They drove into the bog site. And 18 minutes later, they drove out of the bog site. And in the 18 minutes, they had killed 14 people and wounded another 15 people. They've actually brought the group into this square. This is uh, Glen Fada Park. It's one of the small parking places at the back of the main street. Uh, the Museum of Free Dairy, for anybody who's, who eventually gets there, is now on that site, all of that. I looked to my left and I saw a soldier come around the corner. He dropped to his knee, and as he dropped to his knee, he fired his first shot against the fence. I have to keep my here. As a 16-year-old boy who's just been shot in the stomach, same soldier, second round. 17-year-old Michael Quinn. The bullet went down there. It came out there. It went down there. It exited at the side of his nose. He survived. His own adrenaline, his own momentum kept him moving forward. And out of this group in the corner, three people ran out, and two of them grabbed him before he hit the ground and dragged him off. And then that corner completely cleared. I said three people came out of that square, out of that corner. One of them was still in the square. And that big, tall, skinny guy there, that's me. My friend, Jim Ray, and I were the last two people in Glenfada Park. Both of us ran to get out that gap that had now emptied. And I thought at a point Jim must have run ahead of me. He was in my cross-country team in school. He was in my basketball team in school. He was fit. And he'd been on an awful lot of these recreational riots. So I just assumed Jim had run ahead of me. And when I threw myself against the wall here, there's a woman here starts screaming, get up, young fella, get up. The soldier's coming. I thought she was shouting all the way down here to a young Joe Mahan lay. And then I looked at what she was looking at. My friend Jim Ray was lying there on the curb, half on it, half off it. The first round had gone through his spine. He was already mortally wounded. And the soldier walked across the square, stood about six, seven feet behind and brought his rifle round and put another round in his back. That's the use of force. Um, I looked at the soldier and I knew if I turned, I was dead. So I just stood, I looked at him, I looked him in the eye. And then I watched his rifle because his eyes weren't going to kill me. And I thought something might happen, and it didn't. What he did was just drop the rifle down by his side in his hand, looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, and just walked off. And got back into an armored car. 18 minutes. Those 18 minutes on that Sunday afternoon need not have happened. And if they hadn't happened, I am convinced that the conflict in the North would have ended by the middle of 1972 or certainly by 1973. But what happened here, they had just brought their war to us. It was now time to take our war to them. 1972 was become the bloodiest year of the Northern Ireland conflict. 497 people died in 1972 as a direct response to what happened on Bloody Sunday. It also let loose the IRA in Belfast, and this was Bloody Friday in Belfast, probably one of the worst days in Belfast. A series of something like 20 bombs had gone off within 40 minutes. People were running from the site of one bomb onto the next bomb. And this actually gave the justification for armed loyalists and loyalist paramilitary groups to go on the offensive. And that's why 1972 was to become the bloodiest year of the Northern Ireland conflict. What did we learn from that? 
there was no talking. There was no discussion. This was about force. This was about pushing, about being pushed and being and pushing back. There was no room in this for the force of argument. The argument came, as the old expression went, from the barrel of a gun. I, uh, in 1976, I got really sick. And I, particularly after Bloody Sunday, and, and actually this image sort of sums it up, and the image of the woman walking through that debris summed it up. We started a campaign for civil rights for houses, for jobs, for votes. This was not about free in Ireland. This was not about the reunification of Ireland. For loyalism, this wasn't about maintaining the, the link with Britain. This is about three things, houses, jobs, and votes. We're talking about civil rights, and here we were, 1972, 73, 74, 75, 76. We were denying the ultimate civil right to an awful lot of people, the right to life. And from 1972, that's when I started questioning what I was about. And I was convinced that the war would go on, but there had to be another way. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to Derry in 1978, I'd had some discussions at that point. I, I was, uh, my role with them, um, the Republican movement was done as far as I was concerned, but I had allies. I had people who understand who understood the reason why I did it. I also had some people who didn't understand, but they were on the fringes of the movement. It was a strange sight, I think, you know, for some guy they knew who stood on the street with a gun in his hand, suddenly do we start talking about peace and peacemaking? But that's when you have to start looking at where we really need to be. And could we achieve this? And start working in community on small projects that were actually showing people, proving your bona fides. I mean, we're living in a war zone. The detritus of war is all around us. Our kids are walking down, building, you know, down streets, going to school over debris and whatever else. There are armed soldiers on the streets. People are still dying in Derry in 1976. So it's not to say like the war was over and I had to say, here's a nice wee cushy number. And this is long before the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. So the, the European Union weren't putting any money into this. So it certainly wasn't the corporate peace business that I was working for. This was a an, an initiative that a few of us got together. And that's what we started doing. And eventually started to talk to people about what had happened as a result of what we set up. One of the impacts of that, up to 20,000 members of the Protestant community had gone from the West Bank of the river crossed the river, and were never coming back. Employment had failed completely. Uh, multinational investment had pulled out of the area. All of the shirt factories, and that was our main industry. At one point, there were 50 shirt factories in the area, manufacturing men's shirts, manufacturing pajamas, and they were all gone. They decided it was cheaper to make 10 shirts in Turkey than it was to make one, well, you experience of that yourselves, than it was to make one shirt in Terry. So there was nothing really, even if we could fix this, even if we could stop this conflict, there was nothing to encourage those members of the Protestant community, community back. But I think the key word in that is community, because they were part of a community. And how do we link them back? How do we build that trust? And actually, sometimes this stuff's simple. My mother worked, left school when she was 14 years of age, went to work in a shirt factory. My mother worked alongside Protestant neighbors in the shirt factory. Most of the older women in Derry would have worked alongside Protestant neighbours in the shirt factory. And nobody questioned religion or any of the rest. They were just trying to put food on the table. And it was women were the backbone of employment in Derry, of the economy in Derry. So I talked to my mother and we talked about some of the old neighbours that had gone. And my mother said, I wish I knew where Mrs. Walker was or I wish I knew how her daughter got on or did they get married or all of this stuff, you know. And that was the start of a project, actually linking people back together again. And I remember the first minibus I brought, a small bus that I brought across the river to meet some of the older Protestant neighbors who used to live in the neighborhood we lived in. And uh, the women were excited about doing it. They wanted to have these conversations, sit around a cup of tea and all the rest of it. But I remember actually going to the waterside and bringing a bus back. And I remember the nervousness of the, of the women from the Protestant community who are now coming back to where they used to live. And we actually had them, you know, go knock on go knock on doors of the houses that they used to live and go on and meet people. And that was where we started making those links. And then you start understanding 
that this conflict, and it's easy, I think, to justify um, anything and particularly justify violence. If you feel you're the only person that's been affected by it, if you think you've got a monopoly on the suffering and the conflict, then you're going to throw everything at it. Sit down and talk with a woman who's lost her son. Sit down and talk with a girl who's lost her father. And they just happen to be from the other side of the river and they just happen to be Protestant and you realize that the suffering there is just the same as the suffering here. And that was where a lot of the project work that we, you know, that, that I was eventually getting involved in and start building, start working with people, build this hope. You know, I think I heard a line somewhere there and it felt that it fell in so well. Despair. I've had enough of despair, you know. I want hope. And that was that, you know, we were just actually trying to move stuff on for people. And I'm very conscious of my time. So folks, from that experience, from the engagement in the armed conflict, actually allowed me the opportunity of understanding why people do this. You know, I, 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 I mean, I was in Ukraine before Ukraine even had the map. I was in Crimea before Crimea, before people even knew where Crimea was. I was in Lebanon in, in, in 1994. When people are saying you're mad, somebody said to me, I'll pick you up at the airport. I said, Are you serious? The last time somebody got picked up at the, at the airport in Beirut, they got chained to a radiator for 10 years. <laughs> you know, so uh, and, I mean, that part of it is when you go to these places, you talk to people, their reason for getting involved in struggle is the same reason that we have. We wanted to make a change. And for me, yes, there were other ways. Unfortunately, as a 17 year old, you're not going to have access to the other ways. You're not going to have access to the things that are going to make that political change. And what this was about, yeah, if I had to do it over again, if I was 17 and in the same situation, honestly, I would. But I'll tell you honestly, I would, if knowing what I know now, I would try to make sure that not as many people died and not as many people got injured and not as many people were to be impacted on by this. And, it, and that it wouldn't last as long as it eventually was to last. I mean, the cost of what I do now is the three and a half thousand deaths. The cost of what I do now is the tens of thousands of people whose families have been affected by this conflict. And the tens of thousands of young people who decided that they'd follow what I did and ended up spending years in prison. Um, I want to throw this open for you because I know I haven't really got to the, talk about the point where, you know, I mean, what you learn from this, where do you use it? I'll tell you, standing on a street with a gun in your hand, I, and I've said this, yeah, you might change some lives. When you start using everything that you've learned, when you realize that you walk into a room and you can't bully people into your way of thinking, that you get yourself ready when you walk in a room, you prepare your argument, you put it on the table, and you find out that as a result of that, and 12 years, 12 long years work, um, that you can change the lives of thousands of people who pre previously thought, I am where I am and I can't change. And one of the proofs of that was the historic constitutional abuse inquiry. Walking into a room with politicians who were on the other side from me in the 1970s, I'm walking into a room, to be fair, with politicians who were on my side in the 1970s and making those strange alliances. And I mean, the strange thing about it, and quite a few of them knew my history, we went to Stormont in 2012 and asked for an inquiry. We asked for legislation so an inquiry could take place. 108 members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, in other words, Everybody to a man that day said, you can have your inquiry. That's the force of argument winning over the argument of force. I could not have beat them. We could not have beat them into that situation. Guys, I'm going to throw the floor open there. I could talk for the next two hours. Anybody that knows me knows that. I'm going to throw the floor open. And look, I just one rule. Don't edit the question. Let me edit the answer. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your story. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over to you. And remember to please keep your question uh, short.
something that kind of was like on the edge of your story a lot was religion and like the balance of like the Catholicism being such a strong part of your identity, but also being terrible in a lot of ways. And I wonder how you kind of like balance those two competing ideas. Okay, um, well, I, I'm going to put my hand up and say I'm still a practicing Catholic. Um, my faith's important to me, but I do separate my faith from the institution that raised me. Completely different thing. And one thing I will point out, and I've actually seen it on a couple of pieces, people describing what happened in the North as a religious war, as a conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Actually, it wasn't. For me, it never was. It was never about sectarianism. Sectarianism came from the conflict. Sectarianism was certainly in some areas. And, you know, we talk about the Shankill butchers and we talk about the Catholic reaction force, you know, the Shankill butchers who literally butchered um, people walking home at night, pulled them into a black taxi, took them off and, and took them and, uh, and tortured them. And these guys were butchers. And you take that side of it, but says, oh, uh, and part of the just, part of what comes from that is yeah, that's Protestants doing that. So suddenly somebody decides they want to react to that. And then what happens, you get 12 people in a Pentecostal church up on a hill in Armagh doing absolutely nothing to anybody but holding a prayer meeting and a group who believe they're now acting in reaction to what had happened um, now decide that they're going to spray this town church with machine gun fire and another eight people are killed. Sectarianism was, was what fueled the conflict. It wasn't, it wasn't the reason. For me, it wasn't the reason of the conflict. I mean, I could talk about partition and the reason why we only had six counties, uh, but I think that's history class and I'm not doing history right now. So, I mean, you look at the, if you look at that, I mean, for me, it, my personal view was it never was a religious war. Well, religion became a great tool of division for politics. And it became a great excuse for bad politics. And it's something I think everybody needs to look at. It's not just religion. You look at ethnicity, look at all of the all of the, the diversity of, of reasons why people should feel they're different than us. And particularly right now, take a look here. And I'm not chastising anybody, but you know, take a look around your own country and see, you know, what we see in a different guise. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. My question was that about sectarianism. <laughs> you concede. <laughs> I guess I'm I'm curious if you could speak to the, the state of the country today. Mark begins feel like the topic is over. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the Great Friday, the Good Friday Agreement brought brought us an awful lot of benefits. Um, but I think the Good Friday Agreement, as was obvious, um, within four months of it being uh, of it being in place, in August uh, on August the fifteenth, nineteen ninety eight, a group who decided that this peace process was going nowhere, they were vehemently against it, called themselves the Real IRA, drove a car into a small farming town in County Tyrone called Oma, left the car there on a market day, and. Uh, it blew up and 29 people were killed. So not everybody agreed that this was a way forward. Actually, the 29 people who died in Oma, it was the largest single um, catastrophe in the Northern Ireland conflict. And there have been other things since that. But I think, the, I mean, in the first year after the Good Friday Agreement, there was a breathing space. There was time to sit down and argue about how we could move this thing forward. One of the big issues was weapons. You know, um, the government wanted, the British government wanted the IRA to surrender. Well, this was an intractable war that the IRA weren't prepared to lose and the British government weren't prepared or weren't able to win. So we had to find some way of coming out of this that left everybody not necessarily with the egg on their face. So an agreement was reached to that uh, weapons would not, there was never going to be a token sword placed on a table to say this war is over. So an agreement, again, about how we dispose of weapons. And weapons would be put beyond use. And that involved an international community, an international delegation, Norwegians, South Africans, Canadians, Americans, all got involved in how we do this. And that was how we end up with thousands of tons of weapons literally being buried in concrete. 
But again, the difficult with that is we still had to get over the war. I mean, one of the problems was, as I said, with three and a half thousand deaths, tens of thousands of people with injuries, where do they fit into the picture of healing and moving forward? Actually, I found in discussions with some of the families of those who'd been most directly affected by the conflict, that they were the people most prepared to give. They were the people most prepared to say, let's move on. It wasn't about forgetting what happened. You could never forget that. But let's build it, let's start building a future that our children and our grandchildren don't have don't have to suffer. Um, so I mean the the Good Friday Agreement created the start of what should have been the end of the war. Um, it did take the gun out of Irish politics, but then when you have nothing happening for the first two years, people get frustrated. And through the process of that, we've had three separate falls of government. We're currently on one right now over a political stalemate of whether there's going to be a border on the island of Ireland, uh, which would be a breach of the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. And the Ulster Unionists of the Democratic Unionist Party have decided that the assembly would collapse rather than they sit on it and work out a deal that makes sure there isn't a border on Ireland, but that the European, European unions, um, that its regulations are met. So we've got the politics that we still have to argue over. And there are still a few people out there who still believe that the gun holds part of the solution of the way forward. Um, they're in the wrong place, if that's what they're thinking. You want to be talking to communities about how they're affected. You want to be talking to communities about employment. You want to be talking to communities about education, about a future, about a health service. All of the stuff that you're talking about right now in this country. Those are the issues now that should be in front of people's minds, not the protocol, not whether there's going to be a hard border in Ireland, not whether we're talking about um, Irish unity or we're talking about maintaining the link, uh, link with Britain. People, they're fed up listening to all of that and not becoming an excuse for somebody to walk out and slam a door. What we need is people around the table. And as I said, we got people around the table. I got 108 members around the table around a set of tables who actually agreed that this was one thing all of them could, could agree on. And what we need to be doing is persuading those politicians back into the room so they can all agree that education, that health, that mental, that certainly trauma, um, that all of those issues, that youth employment are all things that we need to be looking at if we're talking about moving forward and forget about sitting outside the room and boycotting and stuff, you know? I, hopefully that answered your question. I get lost in my own train sometimes. <laughs> I have a question from our virtual audience. From your lived experience and work in other countries, what would you tell Americans as we are worried about our increasing polarization and its potential for violence? First of all, seek the truth. You know, your view of somebody else is what colors your thought and how you deal with them. Forget about listening to the blurb. Forget about the ads on TV. Forget about, you know, the naysayers and the people who are telling you this is the only way forward. Actually, the way forward is for each of us as individual members and parts of the society, be ye gay, be ye straight, be ye black, be ye white, be ye red, be whatever, is that all of that is what makes a society and go back and look in fact just take a dollar or a half dollar out of your pocket turn it around and look at the back of it a pluribus you know. from many one and that's everybody that's what you need to be looking at not the one that says we're better we're higher we're smarter you know we're we're, we're whatever than them. Take a look around the room. Take a look at your own neighborhood. Walk around the corner and take a look and see the guy on the street and ask yourself the question, why? What can I do? What can be done? And the other thing, what are we not doing that allows this to happen? And I think it's more about that. I mean, for me, at the end of every day, one of the questions I ask myself, you know, and yeah, you have days when things don't go great. And you can say, if only I had done this, and just think about this, if only I'd done that, if only I'd listened to so-and-so, if only, 
forget that. Your question is, in the situation I just found myself and walked out of today, or came through today, what did I learn from it? And you're going to learn every day. And I think the key of it's tolerance. But then tolerance means that if you're going to be tolerant, it means the other guy has to concede the fact, you know, that's a, that, that they have something to give as well. And a lot of people don't want to give it. Um, Sinn Féin are the largest party in Northern Ireland and they're the largest party in the south of Ireland now as well and being kept out of government in both jurisdictions for a few different reasons. Um, they've made a lot of calls for a border poll in recent times. Do you see this as a good time for a conversation about a united Ireland or there'll be a bit more work to do? I, I actually believe the conversation, the conversation about a united Ireland is a conversation that should be ongoing. I don't think there's a particular time when it's the right time to have it. I mean, if we, if we were honest, I mean, the time to have that that conversation was 1922, but you know, we didn't get a choice in that one. We didn't get a choice in 1956. We didn't get a chance after Stormont fell in 1972. But it, right now, certainly what I, I, I feel, and particularly our young people, who've actually lost interest of the individual party politics, actually see that there's a new future to be had here. And I think that new future is in a new Ireland. And again, it's how that's, I, and I hate this expression, it's how it's actually sold to people. Because I've spoken to people about this new Ireland, and the first thing they're going to say is, ah, but if I go, if, if the border goes away and we go down there, we're going to have to pay for our health service. We're going to have to do a list. Look, forget about it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a new Ireland. We're talking about a different Ireland. You know, we're talking about an Ireland that would be supported not just by our own people and all of our own people, but will be supported by a lot of people outside of Ireland. And I think one of the things to look at, I mean, my logic, and this may be flawed and it may be simple, right now um, in the North, as a result of the census, the unionist community, according to the numbers, are 49.3% of the population of the North. If we say there are 2 million people in the North, so just say that gives them 50% of the population of the North. On the island of Ireland, there are 5 million people. Right now, Ulster Unionists are 50% of a place that doesn't give a damn about them. The British don't care. If you were to have a referendum in Scotland, England, and Wales tomorrow about should, should the North of Ireland stay with us or not, it would be gone if they thought they could do it. There are 50% of a place that Britain doesn't care about. I would actually rather be 1 million people in a population of 5 million. I'd rather be 20% of something than be 50% of nothing. And I think that's what we have to sell. And the fear is, and the fear among unionists is, you know, our culture is going to be destroyed. Our faith's going to be, you know, all of, you're going to find a million reasons not to do it. And then you go back and look at the Good Friday Agreement, which a lot of them disparage. The Good Friday Agreement actually guarantees their civil and religious liberty. It guarantees them a right to the expression of their culture. All of the things that they're saying they're going to lose are actually guaranteed in the Good Friday Agreement. What's to fear here? Britain can be our neighbor. But they don't have to be our oppressor as well. I have another question um, from our virtual audience that touches on the issue of identity. Uh, this is from Joan. She says, in 2013, when I was studying in Derry, there was concern that the younger generations would forget about the lessons from the troubles due to the economy and identity politics. How does peacemaking and shared remembrance become endemic to communities and be resilient to economies and politics? Um, that's actually, and one of the things we're in this, you know, I, I think in any other society, they would try to set up like a, you know, a, a, a special government department that deals with, you know, getting beyond the past. Um, anytime the government have got involved in trying to, in trying to, put programs and projects together, you know, people just, they, they lose interest. This is communities, that, it is communities that are making these changes. Peacemaking, if you want to see peacemaking work, don't think of it as peacemaking. 
Think about it as community development. That's what it is. And I think there's a lot, of, I mean, there definitely is. I know I've been involved in quite a few of the projects and there are right across the north and in fact, across the border in Donegal. Um, there are projects that are working with young people that don't let them um, lose sight of what happened during the conflict, but actually allow them the, the space um, to start moving other stuff in place so that we can work to build a society, a better society. And, you know, the young people's programs are exciting. They're amazing. Uh, you know, and, and to be honest, one of the best parts of that is when you get some of these young people at 13, 14, 15 years of age who've never experienced any of this, who've heard the stories and seen the statues and watched the marches and seen it on TV, you know, and they sit down and they talk with somebody's granny or somebody's grandfather. That's where you make the change. Because, you know, a government department hand them a piece of paper saying this is how you move forward. No, that's not how you do it. But I think it's the involvement of communities that are going to engage our young people and is engaging our young people um, in making that change and creating the understanding we need as a society to be able to move forward. Because young people are a vital part of this future. And in fact, you know, I mean, I think some of the political parties are actually starting to realize that now. You know, young people can't be dismissed. And the other thing is young people aren't now going to vote the way their parents voted because that's the way their grandparents and their and their great-grandparents voted. Young people are free thinkers now. And I'm fortunate in that to my, uh, my own kids, you know, I mean, the idea of going out and meeting somebody, w wondering whether they're Catholic or Protestant, asking them what school they went to, so to what will that down, um, doesn't happen. All right, we have time for one more question. Thank you for being here. I was wondering, um, from your experience, uh, could you speak to the importance of the hunger strikes in the early 80s and kind of how you viewed them at the time as someone who was active in that struggle? Yeah. Um, it's part of the difficulty when you try to, you know, when you try to sort of um, go through the timeline in this. And the hunger strike uh, certainly was, um, I mean, two of the guys from my city, both of them, I knew Patsy O'Hara and Mickey Devine, I knew both of them. Um, and the, the hunger strike certainly consolidated any view within the Catholic or nationalist community that there was something else outside of this that could make this change. Um, you know, I think it showed the barbarity that we knew was already there of the British government and the lengths that they would go to um, to try and ensure that, that you know, that that this wasn't recognized, that what ha was happening in the North wasn't recognized as a political con conflict. That was the consequence of bad politics. As long as they could criminalize us, they could, they could shut it down and they could sell it to the English and the Scots and whoever else they wanted to sell it to. But I think the personal impact of the conflict was it, in communities, it mobilized communities um, certainly against the British, certainly against the government. And in the same way that, you know, that um, Bloody Sunday, almost, and I, and I don't want to be disrespectful or be seen as being disrespectful in this, but without a doubt, I mean, after Bloody Sunday, recruitment to the IRA just went through the roof. The hunger strikes actually had the same sort of impact. But what I will say is, as well as young, as well as particularly young people wanting to be engaged in the armed conflict, a lot of young people realized that there was a political road that you could go down here. In fact, the leadership of the Republican movement right now, and some of the younger leadership of the Republican movement, was a direct result of the hunger strike. Um, it was a, again an awful price to pay, had to find another way to fight a war. But if you can fight a war in a room rather than fight it on the street, you know, you're going to be saving lives. And uh, I definitely don't believe that Maggie Thatcher had any idea of the political impact um, and the growth of Sinn Féin to become as a direct result of her decisions that led to the hunger strike. That's why we have the leadership in Dublin that we have. That's why we have uh, the motivation of young Republicans to be involved in a political process that's making change if it done anything, it it repoliticized the conflict, and I think from that, much as there was a price to be paid for it, 
I think there was a, another one of those things as I said, what did I learn today? Yeah, it was learned. Well, Mr. McCord, thank you so much for sharing your story and inspiring us to uh, be community developers and peace activists. It's been it's such an honor to have you here in Chicago. Thank you all for attending and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.